Hi, and welcome to a Small Medium at Large podcast. I'm your host, Gail Heisen, bringing you intimate stories that heal and intimate interviews beyond normal boundaries. I want to thank all of you listeners for subscribing, commenting, sharing, and just for being there for us. It's a really wonderful uh, relationship I feel I'm having with hundreds and hundreds of people out there. Today, we have a very special guest who comes to us from a recommendation from our first guest, Sally Rhinefeather. Sally Rhinefeather sent this wonderful woman to us, and after reading her 440-page book, which I just finished last night, started it on Sunday, took me three days, read the whole thing, it was fabulous. I want to talk about our friend here today, Liz. Liz began examining if there was evidence of an afterlife and anything paranormal in 2015, following the passing of her father. While she still considers herself skeptical and an atheist, although she's a cultural Jew, the evidence really blew her away. She's the author of WTF Just Happened, a sciencey skeptic explores grief, healing, and evidence of an afterlife. She is host of a podcast, WTF Just Happened, all about the afterlife and no woo. She also runs Science and Spirituality, private events where an intimate group of you and your friends can learn more about the science behind an afterlife and get readings from highly evidential mediums who have been tested by scientists. So let's welcome Liz here today, and she's going to talk about her book, WTF, which of course we know means what the fuck just happened. So let's welcome her here today. Welcome. So much for having me, and I'll just add a little note. To everyone, since the book is long, it's actually a very fast conversational read, and I'm in the middle of recording the audio book. So, everyone, if you prefer that for a longer book, that'll be out. Well, I have to say, I find when there are books that have a lot of technical things in it, or they're giving you samples of of exercises you can do, it takes longer to get through the book. This book was the kind where I said to my family, just don't bother me. I'm really enjoying this and I don't want to stop. I have to read through the whole thing. So except for a couple of interruptions, that's how I read it from cover to cover. And I felt completely immersed because that's the kind of book I like. I feel like you're talking to me and that we're sitting there and you're telling me all these things that happened. And so I had no difficulty with the 440 pages. I, I went through, also I enjoyed the typesetting and the way you did conversations. I liked the way you did the different texts. So I just, I'm, I'm in the process of finishing a book and now I'm thinking I might want to change those conversations to the kind of text uh, style that you used. So I'll see what happens right now. I have the kind of swirly things going on. So before we start getting into the book, I always like to ask about your childhood and whether there was anything when you were growing up that might have propelled you into this uh, skepticism that you have, which I thought was incredible amount of skepticism. Uh, and also that um, I just want you to know, I had the same kind of upbringing. My parents were atheists. We were raised atheists, but my uh, uh, Jewish grandparents lived in the, in the downstairs part of our house. So there was all their holidays and all their uh, uh, different things that they celebrated. But all we had for that was knowing about them. It was never really part of our, our growing up. And my dad was always, you know, this whole thing about not believing in a God with a beard or whatever. <laughs> and I'm grateful for that upbringing because it makes me and now my children all critical thinkers before we don't just accept everything that's shown to us. So I just wanted you to know, I felt like a camaraderie with you. So please tell us our audience about your childhood and your parents and your life. Sure. Thank you. Well, I grew up, I'm only child, which uh, makes loss. Loss is hard for everybody. It's not a comparison. But for me, I found that a little extra hard losing my father because there wasn't enough, you know, much of a buffer. But I grew up very close with both my parents in Manhattan in New York City and it's a very overall I mean obviously there are pockets of different cultures in it but it tends to be a very secular culture um god religion it just wasn't part of my life it's not something anyone talked about 
I grew up around a lot of Jewish people, but secular Jews like myself. So mm-hmm. some went to synagogue, some didn't. I I went to a lot of bar and bar bar and bat mitzvahs, but it felt more like if you know God was mentioned in the rituals or prayers, it wasn't serious. It was just historic and kind of ritualistic rather than literally believing in a God. So it just, I mean, actually still don't believe in God, but that being said, just, it was, it was just very irrelevant to my life. And I think part of that, when you're raised that way, it made me not want to think about it or explore further because who, you know, if you're, 99% sure there's no afterlife why do you want to think about it it's just terrifying so I just tried to push the concept of death as far away from me and my consciousness as possible because all it just all I really logically could see is that when you die you die and that's it and to me I still think um materialism that consciousness is created by a brain and atheism I think that's the default logical. And I think for the other, I very much believe extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. And I think the extraordinary claims is survival, but I feel like I've seen extraordinary evidence at this point. So. And I have to say from everything I read, very thorough, anyone that's out there listening, she's not exaggerating when she says extraordinary evidence. She went and looked for answers and uh it wasn't that she just accepted anything that was presented in front of her you really were the most in-depth skeptic i'd ever seen <laughs> I love that. maybe that step is like dr julie Baishel or dr ed kelly who actually do all the data and experiments but, but well, yeah i'll take that so what did what did you originally think about an afterlife you didn't think it really existed I just assumed consciousness was created by our brain cells. I mean, when I was very little, my parents said, oh, when you die, you go to heaven on a cloud with everybody. That's why I was like three or four. And they're like, and when you lose a tooth, the tooth fairy comes. And, you know, it was all these little childhood fantastical tales. And I got a little older and I was like, oh, well, all that kind of groups (laughs) in. And my parents were like, yeah, you know, I mean, (laughs) you know, they sort of let it sink in that there was no afterlife and materialism and the only concept of an afterlife I had ever really heard was you know very like judeo-christian biblical and that just seemed very again like I absolutely respect anyone's beliefs I don't mean this to be disrespectful but to me that seemed very fantastical and very unrealistic and there was no evidence to back up anything like that and I'd heard about reincarnation but not in the way I began to eventually learn about it. I heard it very, very karma based and also almost as fantastical as the God in heaven. So neither of it, I mean, there was just no reason to think any of that was true beyond wishful thinking. Exactly. So was it 2014 or 15 that your dad passed? 15, 15, yeah. And uh, I just want, I just want to say, This is the thing that you brought up in the book numerous times that I think is important for listeners to hear is that we all grieve in different ways. And I just was wondering if you'd bring up the kind of comments that everybody usually hears that are really worthless (laughs) when you're going through grieving. Oh my God, 90% of the comments are worthless. They're very corrective. They're, in fact, I use a word to describe what a majority of people are grief conversion therapists which I can pair with gay conversion therapists and I don't think highly of either one and it's all about you know it was kind of a snarky way of referring to these people but they're all about not honoring their process and correcting it and saying things like oh you've just got to get back to your life oh they're in a better place it's been long enough they wouldn't want to see you this sad and just constant little cheer up texts like come out have fun And it feels like it's very much they're correcting your grief, not even because they, I mean, consciously, they probably are telling themselves they're being there for you, but really they are uncomfortable with how you are behaving and presenting your grief. They don't, they just want to change your presentation so they can have comfort with it and it can fit into the societal 
approved way of handling grief. And I think one of the major misconceptions is that our society believes a healthy grieving, which there is no such thing, I don't think, it's individual. There isn't healthy or unhealthy, it is grieving. And there is a misconception that the healthiest thing you can do is get back to your old life as quickly as possible. But very often, your old life, you change. Grief transforms you. And maybe everything you had in your pre-grief life works for you, such as your career, your friend group, or maybe you really evolve into a different person and what you had before doesn't work for you. So I think this concept of going back instead of like going forward and evolving into how grief has transformed you with our is a is something that I I personally found very I would from my knowledge of grief from my personal experience of speaking to others and again this won't apply to everybody is I feel the concept of going back to your old life is for me very unhealthy and you know so right so there and there so change occurs after we lose somebody that was very important or deep relationship or very close or even whatever role they played when you lose them in the body it affects you in a deep way and I one thing that I don't like when people say is oh well it's been a year you should be over that now or it's been two months it should be over that and I found with grieving like being the intuitive person that I am I'm grieving before they even find out they're sick and dying so I can feel the coming of it. And it makes me very sensitive and very emotional. And I feel like other people think, what's wrong with her? Why is she crying? He's he's fine. He's not, you know, but that's not really what's happening. They're really going on the path towards, you know, passing away. And um, like you, my dad was the most important person in my life growing and the person that, you know, we had an unconventional life and he did crazy things but I loved him for all of it. And, you know, none of it was necessarily all positive. A lot of it was not, but that didn't matter. I loved that man. And when you lose that person, other people would say to me, oh, but he did all those things to you. How could you be, you know, that way? Or how could you feel that much of a loss? Because when we have that relationship that we feel that way with that person, we don't, we don't, it it could, I find that people I've known that have passed it's still taking me this many years. I still grieve about somebody who died, you know, 25, 30 years ago. I might just be driving in the road and all of a sudden some emotion comes up that feels like in a, a relationship with that person or a memory. And, and you cry. But other people hold that inside and they don't let out the emotions of the grieving. And they feel like that, oh yeah, I'm supposed to go back to work. And I think they do all those things to take themselves away from feeling about grieving. And you right. allowed yourself to go through all of the different feelings you were having. And I think that's admirable. Oh, thank you. I appreciate that. Oh. Yeah, and I tend to think grief is for life. Like I've lost my dad. I've since lost some animals and my mentor. So since my book came out, so ever since then, it, you know, I mean, and it, it, you grief builds as you get older because more people pass and I feel like I've come to realize grief is a lifelong part of who you are yes and it's a process that doesn't have a time schedule right it rises and it falls it does it's you know comes when we might least expect it so I think this is an important topic for listeners to be uh hearing about because everyone around us is going to die, including ourselves. It's a factual thing. It's not like something that, oh, if I do this, I'm not going to die, you know? (laughs) Absolutely not. 100% of us, 100% of people will deal with grief unless they pass away themselves very young. And 100% of us will deal with mortality in some way. So before we start talking about mediumship, and things that happened with these, and I have a couple stories I want to tell you about mediumship and spoon bending. I was wondering about what, you know, what is the, what was your first thought that prompted you to think there is an afterlife, that this possibly could be real? 
it was kind of two tier. The very first thought that got me even thinking maybe there's something more was in my desperation. And I didn't actually think I'd be able to sit and do this, but some, I began to wonder, is it possible to turn back time? And I thought if maybe we're doing this, we wouldn't necessarily know if you're fully turning back time and erasing your consciousness. And who knows, maybe I, we have turned back time and we have no idea we accomplished that. So it was just a thought. And I started reading a lot about Einstein's theories of time relativity, where I learned that time. Oh, and I guess one of the thoughts that prompted me to even think this is that the majority of science fiction, if you look at historic science fiction, ends up coming true. So then I thought, well, time travel is one of the main things. And essentially, I learned that theoretically, yes, you can turn back time. Practically, and you can move time ahead, you can play with time. Practically, it's not so possible. We can't actually have the equipment to build rockets that travel close to the speed of light. But the fact that theoretically, something as immutable as time is not as linear and factual and exactly how we perceive it as it is made me think well what else and that was kind of where my mind began to be a little more flexible about this and my next thought was and I don't think this at this point but I did then was so our consciousness is created by a brain and by a set of neurons firing now if this has happened once to create me and most likely our universe is eternal and that's how, about this specific one I think big bang or big crunch or something along those lines is most likely but most likely there will be ever existing big bangs big crunches you know universe fast other solar systems with Goldilocks planets that are conducive to complex and in material intelligent beings most likely another set of brain neurons would create a human or highly complex individual that I would get to be not me as Liz but as if I got to be another person at least experience consciousness my dad wouldn't be my dad again I wouldn't be me exactly but when your other alternative is complete eternal obliteration that I'll take I'll take getting to be somebody else again and I actually thought when you think of like eternal iterations of big bangs and big crunches and even the millions of years I believe that this planet will most likely if we don't destroy it but let's say we manage to not and it lives as long as it can until the sun goes out and most likely it made more sense that I would get to be conscious again as some other being and then I just had this kind of little random thought if that's true is there some way that I cannot even begin to understand that memories have carried over and I googled that and that's where I found Dr. Jim Tucker and Ian Stevenson. And that was the turning point, uh, biggest turning point in my life. One of them was finding those two in the division of perceptual studies. And so then your original thinking about the afterlife started to change after you started reading and attending courses or studying with these people. And what, yes, did, what did it change to? Wow. Well, the first step was here are these logical science-minded people you know dr jim tucker and ian stevenson studying cases of kids with past life memories they're not talking about karma they're not trying to tap into past lives in some spiritual sense they're child psychiatrists at the university of virginia and professors at uva studying cases of kids with past life memories from a database perspective and getting really positive results and you know from there you read about you know, the division of perceptual studies, you I found Dr. Bruce Grayson. Once you find one of them, you start to find them all. So I found Dr. Julie Beichel and Mark Bacuzzi at Winbridge. And I was just like, what the actual fuck? Like I, it was the first hint. I was like, this is the, the, the most remarkable stuff I have ever heard. But then there was the other part. This is so remarkable. There has to be a catch. And also, this seems so solid, so logical, and valid. But if something, and I still don't get this part, but with this huge body of valid data of the most remarkable stuff ever, how is the news and science not all over this? How is 
everything not stopping to talk about this and that that, so that's why I was like oh this can't be true there's got to be a catch that I'm not seeing but logical skeptics and scientists who are saying it's not true they're smarter than me I'm I'm not insecure about my intelligence but that's a fact there's quite a few people out there smarter than me by far and so it's like and these smarter than me people significantly smarter like Neil deGrasse Tyson or at the time Stephen Hawking was living I was like they would just look at this and say oh this is what it's really about and I just it was something I wouldn't be able to put together and I also thought that with the skeptics so I was like okay I don't want to get my hopes up too much but I am enthralled the the fact that this data and research exists is absolutely remarkable so that's kind of where I was in the first part of all of this well and this um we're saying this was around 2015 when you started doing a lot of this research and reading all of these books and it was also during the the time that you were doing also intense grieving and spending a lot of time at home alone and um you know searching the soul or the different experiences you were having in the grieving of your dad. So somewhere along that line, you decided to see, you were the most thorough skeptic I've ever seen on the preparation. (laughs) If you could share with the audience how you prepared to research mediums and the work that they do and what information you gave them in order to be sure that they were not, because, As we all know, and I'm sure that many of our listeners know, there are mediums out there who are truly mediums. And then there's a lot of charlatans out there or people that prey on the motions and sadness and grief another person has, and they make money off of that. There's two different types out there. And I was wondering if you could talk to the audience about how your research brought that to you and how you discovered there were definitely two different types. Okay, yes. So I'll start with how I prep for medium readings. And I ended up, I I mean, I I can go into how I came across and even found the first mediums I went to, but but however you did. Okay, I'll start with the protocols I take when I get medium readings. I use a fake name. Sometimes I do use my first name because Liz or Elizabeth, I mean, that is a really common name. And I did use it some too, because I wasn't sure if I really had to for this to work because I wasn't, I mean, I didn't know if this even really worked, but since Dr. Julie Beichel's studies did use real first names, I wondered if maybe I should. And I wouldn't have, if I didn't have like one of the most common first names in the world, I did a fake last name. I have friends pay, not family members, friends pay if they need credit cards. I use a VPN virtual private network when I log into the website, just in case they have like some technology, some FBI quality technology to trace where I'm coming from. Um, With two of them down the line, these weren't the first ones, but this has now become known because one of them, Janet Mayer, who is a wonderful medium, is certified by the Forever Family Foundation. And she um, she requires a paper check and that you fill out these pieces of paper. And so I got like a cashier's check. So, you know, I mean, I don't have paper checks anyway, but even normally if I ever need a paper check, I get one from my mom. And I was like, I'm not having my family name on this. And then I used rubber gloves to touch all the paper for in case. I couldn't believe she had a fingerprint reader. <laughs> knows I did that never a forever family knows it's become Lloyd Arbach knows it's become this huge joke and I'm like well I thought that would be a really normal like thing to do so those are all the precautions I took um some of the medium readings were in person but I was like looking kind of slightly at their ears making sure they didn't have like a little earpiece and maybe a camera above with an assistant like researching me and feeding them you know I I was like I thought of everything of everything. <laughs> of everything and some proved to be incredibly genuine I have concluded and some proved to be frauds and some proved to be you know I, I think the majority tend to be very genuine hearted and not necessarily able to provide 
the highest level of verified scientific evidence but some really can and then that's there's, those are the kind of the three types that i think and lloyd arbach will speak about this in his class at the ryan education center that there's the really good ones that are genuine there's ones that you know and of course there's degrees in all of this there's ones that maybe are somewhat intuitive and have been told they're mediums and they live in sort of a culture that believes in this but they can't really do the level they claim and then there's ones that are deceptive and doing cold reading oh and then he also Lloyd also says there's the worst which I have not encountered but ones that actually can do this and use it very deceptively to also lie and say things like oh like you have a curse on you and you know, you have to spend like a thousand dollars on this candle to clear the curse. And they also have abilities. So they have gotten accurate information that people will believe about the curse. And again, I have never encountered that. That was just warned to me by Lloyd. So, so I, I have to say in reading your book, uh, just so our audience knows, there were a lot of people that you worked with or did things with that have actually all been on my podcast. So I've had Lloyd Auerbuck and Dean Radin and Russell Targ and Sally Reinfeather was, you know, our first guest. But I I had to research because Lloyd Auerbuck, and I just found the paper today, we met exactly 20 years ago in 2003. And it was for the um, California Society for Psychical Research. And I gave my first talk ever in my life, which I had never, ever done anything like that before that day. And it was about um, a remote viewing that I had done for Dean Radin. And it was a remote viewing that they thought was exceptional. And I think it was shown to the Navy in a talk that he gave and maybe for some other talks it was presented. But it was for, uh, I was a guest of Ruth Inga Hines. She was, had me come there. But Lloyd filmed it. He was doing the filmmaking for her because every presenter was filmed at this. And they'd been doing this for many, many years. And so here I am being filmed. And I'm telling my story about how I drew this mosque, you know, in Istanbul. Which I didn't know at the time anything about it. I just knew that I was drawing this mosque. And I kept telling them how... I see mosaics, that there's incredible mosaics in there. But nobody ever confirmed that because you're only looking at a photograph of the outside of the target that you're supposed to be remote viewing. So at the end of my talk, Ruth Inga jumps up and says, that mosque is in Istanbul. I've been there and it's filled with the most beautiful mosaics in the world. So I didn't know that till like a year after I had done this you know, particular remote viewing. But when I finished my talk and Lloyd filmed me, he came up to me at the end and said, I can't believe somebody didn't try and get you and make money off of you. Yeah, that's a good point. I couldn't understand what he meant by that because I just live this way. And so I don't think of it as anything mm -hmm. special or whatever. Uh, and then, and then to have him on my show, you know, 20 years later or 19 years later for us to have an interview together and having met that one particular time, but it was memorable. And then I'm reading through all your book about these wonderful things he shared at his classes with you. I just sent him an email saying, do you have any classes in the Bay area? Cause I would love to attend something. I, I just think he They're was all virtual. If you ever would do that. So. Oh, they're all online. So that was, so did you, but you got to meet in person and at these re retreats or things that you attended, um, other conferences and events. And he seemed to be a wonderful uh, guide or person to, to, to help you along this path of investigation. And he's a, he's a skeptic. I mean, I, his talks about ghosts and these different things in the afterlife, I feel like they're all very credible. He's not into the woo woo. And uh, he's a wonderful person for people to listen to. Yeah, I met him through uh, in person. I started volunteering for the Forever Family Foundation and he's president. So I got to meet him in person and I've since gotten to know him. And he's 
yeah, he's he really was important in helping me. I was wondering if you could just tell our audience what the family, uh, what the Forever Family Foundation is. Sure. I actually don't know Mark Ireland. I've heard of him, but I think since I've been involved, he hasn't been there. But so the Forever Family Foundation, it was started in 2002 by Fran and Bob Ginsburg. And Fran sadly passed away in 2020. And she became, she was like a second mom to me, like a mentor. So I definitely really miss her a lot. But Fran and Bob were instrumental in helping me in my early days of grief and still are, I still say Fran is a huge part of my life and Bob definitely very directly in the material world is. And so there, they sadly lost their daughter, Bailey, who was 15 at the time in a car accident. And they think, they thought like I did, especially Bob. Fran was more open to afterlife and psychic abilities. Bob was like me. He's like, oh, this is complete nonsense. And so they started along a somewhat similar journey, investigating all the research. And they end up reaching out to a lot of the researchers and psychic mediums. And they developed a program to get psychic medium certified following science-based testing and strict protocols to assure they're getting accurate information, not just accurate, but very specific because accurate could be, they loved you or you lost a great grandmother. Well, yeah, that's true, (laughs) but, and, and then also they use tight controls so the mediums can't cheat. And they have a scientific advisory board with people, I believe Dr. Jim Tucker's on it, Lloyd Arbach, and they host grief retreats with mediums and they believe science combined with mediumship can help, you know, if you can, if you can have logical demonstration that there is survival of consciousness that will really help people with their grief. So they were very aligned already with my approach. So I reached out to volunteer with them thinking, I mean, at that point I was not only fascinated by this, but I also was like, I've got to get behind the scenes because I was like, there also might be a catch. And I wasn't going to let that go from my mind because I didn't want to lie to myself and, you know, end up crushed when the catch came about. So I kept that always in the back of my mind, but they were instrumental in changing my perception as well as just an amazing support system. And so that work continues today where they have helped. Uh, I have a friend who lost a husband and and a daughter. And um, uh, she found that also to be a very wonderful support organization. And, uh, and those are the only people I've spoken. So I've spoken to people who've used them and had very, very good positive support experience being involved with that when they've had. It's a traumatic thing when you lose a child it's just not in the right order of how we think of things. It's, you know, you expect to, the parent expects to to go before the children, not the children to go before the parent. And right. I know that's a very hard one. And so that must have been, uh, uh, you have to be a strong individual to be able to be in rooms with all those people having your grief and then the grief of the loss of, you know, of their children. So this is are you still involved with this organization now oh very involved yeah I volunteered all their retreats I still do the social media I'm yeah they're a key part of my life so right oh I think I remember Lloyd talking about this also yes I I, so there's been a couple of people about the the forever I think the forever family foundation I believe it was him and Mark but we, you know, it's hard for me to remember exactly because I've done too many shows now. <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, Lloyd's very involved. I mean, they just attract the best people. And then the guests that you meet there, the attendees, just they tend to be just the most wonderful people, too. I mean, yes, they're in a very hard place in life, but you just watch them kind of transform as they get the valid evidence. And it just seems to bring really, really good people together. Yeah. Yeah, and also the comfort of being with others around them that are they're experiencing the same grief, where their friend who hasn't had that loss can't understand it in the same depths. It's not that they don't want to; it just hasn't happened to them. Exactly. So, uh, tell me, is there anything specific in any one specific medium reading that you'd like to share with us or with, with the audience, or uh, something that stood out for you that made you feel like I've really connected to my dad? 
Wow. There at this point, there is so, so, so much. Um, I guess I'll start with the first one was the most impactful in a sense, because I wasn't expecting anything. And I got very, I'll say lucky. The mediums say no, not lucky. It was planned that my first reading was amazing. And what's interesting was she wasn't forever family. She wasn't Winbridge. She was kind of this hole in the wall medium. I was trying to get at that point, you know, I mean, it's just interesting how we'll say the whole thing went as planned because I got on a wait list with another medium, Laurelyn Jackson, who is Winbridge certified, one of the most highly scientifically researched mediums and is certified with Forever Family Foundation. So I got on her wait list and I was like, um, at that point, she, I got a message. Her wait list was like a year to two years. Now, I mean, I've been on her wait list like seven years. She's like, sorry, Liz, it's going to be a while longer. I'm like, that's okay. Um, and, but attend, I attended Laura's group events and I was the one in the back. And I will get to your question about the medium, what the medium got, but it's just interesting how the whole things and I just fall into place you know I was in the back asking all the like every skeptical science question and then I wrote her an email afterwards and I was like oh and I picked her name from Winbridge and then I reached out to another researcher Di Dr. Diane Hennessy Powell if she knew of any medium she would suggest and she also gave me Laura's name so just as like everything was pushing me towards Forever Family Foundation and meeting Fran who was like my mentor and because then I wrote Laura right after the first event that I went to of hers I was like hi I was the like annoying one in the back who wouldn't let you teach because I was asking the science questions every five minutes but I was nice you know I'm not one of the mean skeptics and she's like oh yeah I tried the forever family foundation so that was kind of how I got I mean I, I sense of like gotten to know Laura pretty well and like you know I mean and knowing Fran she was just like my rock so I have a lot of just feeling like I was meant to be in friend's life and she was meant to be in mine as well as Bob and but at the same time while waiting on Laura's list I went to this book reading with my mom who doesn't believe any of this she's like oh yeah I mean like I'll get death anxiety about her passing which I think most one time once people have had one loss they get more anxiety about others and she's like oh you'll do your weird hocus pocus and find some way to talk to me like she doesn't believe this so and your like, mom okay, is mom. A, a clinic is she's a professional psychiatrist she's a psychoanalyst she just asked me to change a, a few identifying details because she's like I don't want all this weird stuff around my name change <laughs> identifying details so I was like okay I'll make you a psychiatrist of a psychoanalyst she's like oh well, you know, that's not that hidden, Liz, but okay. <laughs> so, she's dealing, but she's dealing in the in a field of, you know, the mind or the emotions or the, 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 the personalities. Right. And she works with psychiatrists. She works with neuroscientists. I mean, she doesn't, she's, she's starting to think maybe there's something going on because of everything. Mm -hmm. but her friend group doesn't believe this. And one of the people, a man who had been in a group she was in working with, neuroscientists and studying you know about brain damage and how it affects you know psychological states one of the men in this group it was in the book had passed away and a woman had written a book about this group and their research and she was giving a book rating and it was also partially to, in honor of this man who passed away so I went with my mom I mean this is where it's just so random that I even got this medium's name because no one in her group talks about medium or anything like that but the wife of the man who passed was there and she randomly just comes up to us this was a couple months after my dad had passed and she was like guess who's been visiting me my husband I went to this medium and my face I was in the middle of my research my mom's like oh, fuck, here we go again and I'm like oh my god let me get her name and um so and my, I mean, my jaw's dropping because I haven't heard anyone talk about this. I've been like locked in my room reading all this and grief. And my mom's like, okay, all, this is all my daughter's been talking about. Her dad just passed. So I got this name and I looked at this woman's website. I, she's since no longer giving readings and she was very low key. So I'm not giving her name because like she's not working anymore, but she was just a medium for the short period of time. And I googled you know I went to her website she was like selling crystals I was like oh god she's not studied by scientists I'm like she's gonna be such bullshit she was so 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 good and mediums that 
I've come to know and trust have I found out they know her and they were like all she has is evidence she's not about any of the frills no nonsense none of the love and light stuff she's just like evidence data evidence and I was like they were like that is such a perfect medium for your first reading and she knew stuff it was very interesting some things that stood out my dad has a favorite color in the book I call it green I disguise a few things so I can keep getting evidential readings and she said I don't know why but he's sending this burst of green it's not just like he liked the color it was like he had a whole room in our apartment painted this color he always wore this color it was like kind of pretty significant she said so our building number where I grew up is 120 and in the reading she was like what happened January 20th I was like nothing and I'm you know my heart's sinking I'm like see it's all made up and she wouldn't let go she's like your father keeps saying something about January 20th she's like okay let me put it to you this way he keeps showing me a 120 120 does that mean anything and I was like holy shit you know that's where I grew up and it wasn't just like oh that's where I grew up when my dad was in the hospital and he just kept saying oh I'm, I went back to 120 this morning how's one I mean he didn't but you know delusion you know, right. not, now I don't think delusion. I think he was actually out of body going places, but he kept saying, oh, I was in 120 this morning. How's 120? And so it was very significant. That was just one thing. And then it was just such interesting things. I think two other things that stood out were, so as you know, I said, my mom's a psychoanalyst. I make her a psychiatrist in the book. This medium was like, so I'm seeing that like a couch. Does your mom like a therapist psychiatrist I was like yes she said is she like world renowned like one of the best in the world I'm getting like your dad's telling me she's like the best in the world and that was very special because my mom's I think she's great and uh, her patients love her but no she's not this world famous but my dad would talk about her that way he's like she's the best in the world like there's no one better she's like this world famous top he just was like so enthralled with you know aspects of her and her career and so that was you know it was just things like this and that was more like she was talking to him because that's how he would describe it and she couldn't have known any of this and I, another thing she knew like my grandmother lost a young child like you know way before I was born she knew my grandma like just so many things she got stuff about my dad's personality like He's just the type, like in the end, she just kind of laughed because she's like, I asked him if he had a message for you, like he loves you. And he said, oh, she knows what I think of her. And that's what he would say. That was, it was just remarkable. And that was the first one. But I've had so many at that level of evidence since then. And so many not. But, you know, even if you just have one that can do this, you know. Well, and I think with mediums, it's the same as you were saying in the book as a basketball player. There are some times that the basketball player is getting every hoop and there's sometimes he misses. And I don't think right. that's any different in working in remote viewing or mediumship or any of these things. There's not a hundred percent accuracy. And I think if somebody advertises on their website, I'm a hundred percent accurate, I wouldn't go to that person. <laughs> I wouldn't either. So, so right. you went to many now up to now almost 50 different mediums you have experienced um some connections with your dad by having the feelings that these people are saying things to you that are factual they're not out of thin air they're true things that they wouldn't have known any other way and um I noticed that you even started doing things like uh, experiencing spoon bending. And the reason I want to bring this up is because I want to thank you because not only did you have so many people that I know in your book that I read about, but you were describing things that I've never, I'm exactly opposite you. <laughs> not an intellectual, I'm not scientific, I'm not any of these things. I just I just, when they ask me to be in an experiment and I've been in many different kinds of experiments, I just, I just say, what do you want me to do? And then they tell me, and then I just do the thing, but I never actually ask, do it. Why am I doing it? Or how should I be doing it? No, nothing like that. And um, when you were describing 
spoon bending. It was almost word for word, my description of what I experienced in spoon bending. And there's something that feels so validating to read these words of something that, like, I didn't believe in spoon bending when I went to the spoon bending class. I mean, I'm not a skeptic, but I'm not a, I don't just believe it, you know? And I'm like, well, I'll have to see, or maybe it is, maybe it isn't, da, da, da. And when you experience it right there in your hands, it turning into liquid, and 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 the, the ability to be able to, you know, twirl these things around, you, um, you was my first, this was my first fork. And it's Whoa. it's a it's twirled two or three times on the Amazing. inside there, so kind mm -hmm. of hard to see. But when I touched the tongue, just like that, a tiny touch, and it bent down, I was like, I guess this is real, you know. <laughs> but till that moment, I I didn't, you know, I thought I had some kind of trick or whatever. And right. reading your description. And I'm thinking, this is a skeptical person, and she's mm -hmm. writing exactly what it experiences. And there was another one you did. Um... That's validating to me that you experience it the same oh, way I did. So that exactly, you know. So for me, that means for me, it feels very real. Mm -hmm. Hearing that from you, it was also when you wrote about the photon experiments and the double mm -hmm. slit, and I have been in that experiment and and in, in fact it was an anomaly because I took all the electricity out in the whole building and in the area and Dean Radin was you know writing up about that this was an anomaly but it was in the in relationship to the loss of my dad my dad had died and I was for a year I was similar to you where I, I didn't go anywhere I didn't care if I got dressed I didn't, I just, you know, like nothing, everything yeah. seems so meaningless. And I get a call from Dean and he says, can you come to the, this was at the Institute of Noetic Sciences. Can you come to the lab? I have a new experiment I want you to try. And I tell him, I'm not psychic anymore. After my dad died, I've lost everything. I said, and there was another thing you talked about in the book where medium said to you, don't try to contact someone you've lost for six months. And when I started to think back about that, I was so disappointed that my father didn't just appear. Where with other people, if I want to make contact, I make contact. But him, I thought, here's my closest person. Where did he go? How could I be somebody that talks to the dead if he's not answering? And sure enough, I did not get, and then I started to think the first messages I got, which came in the form of a red-tailed hawk, that was him, it didn't come for months and months after his passing. So when I read that, I also felt comforted to know that mediums had given you this particular advice and it made so much sense to me. And then when you talked about the um, uh, electricity and the um, photons, I never understood, except you wrote it so beautifully about what a photon is and what's actually going on. And after I read that, I said, oh, that's what I was doing. <laughs> With the double slit. And blew, oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> and so when Dean said to come in and I said, I said, I can't do anything psychic. I'll never be able to be in an experiment again. I'm, there's nothing left of me. I went in there and he, we, I'm in the Faraday cage. And he asked me to interfere with this stream of light. And my brain would come in and interfere with it. And then it would show up on the computer that you did an interference. So when the first, we did it the first minute I, I did it, I didn't understand what he meant. So I said, I'd like to redo this again. And when he shuts the Faraday cage, and I know this is his new $20,000 box, that's this photon machine. I look at it and all of a sudden, like all this anger came up in me. And I just said to the thing, I'm just going to blow the fucking thing up. And those were my exact words. And the second I said that, everything went pitch black. And everything, <laughs> you know, when he came to the door after he opened it up, he goes, you're Faraday cage, you're in the black, it's in darkness. And he came and said, you know, you took out all the electricity. <laughs> well, I never understood exactly what the photon machine was and what it was doing until I read your words. And so I just want to thank you for describing these things in a way that I could truly understand after having experienced them. 
So that was another joy I had in reading your book. So I don't want to take up more info on this, but I thought you might talk about your spoon bending experience. And I also would like to talk a little bit about the apports because I have another story to share with you on that. So let's 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 hear about your spoon bending and electrical, what you you know, what the photons or whatever you'd like to talk about, all that. Sure. I can talk about all of the above. That's so it. the spoon bending. And there's a part two to the spoon bending that's gonna be in my next book that I think is very verified. Mm -hmm. What was interesting was I always assumed spoon bending was a stage magic trick. And sometimes it is, but that doesn't mean it always is. And that's actually something Lloyd Arbach said. He was like, just because sometimes something can be fake doesn't mean that it always is. And I was like, oh, that, okay. That's a new way of looking at things. So interestingly, Lloyd Arbach had mentioned that spoon bending was real. And I was going then to another one one of Laura Lynn Jackson's events where she'd be giving a talk and then giving readings to the group. So the night before that, coincidentally, I was just like going through my notes from Lloyd's class and I thought, oh, he keeps mentioning spoon bedding. Note to self, as soon as I'm back from Laura's, like the next, that night, I need to start looking into spoon bedding because if it's real, that will, I, I mean, this ended up not being true, but like along the way, I kept having these sort of moving the goalposts I was like once I see this if this proves to be true I'll believe everything if this proves to be true I'll believe everything that would happen I mean I still have some of that I'm still questioning although I'm a lot more convinced but so just I had this thought okay spoon bending's real that will change that'll be a game changer and so coincidentally I go to Laura Lynn's and she's like we're doing spoon bending I was like that's crazy I was just thinking about that and again, I didn't necessarily really believe it, but I also went with a friend of mine. It's a guy and he's kind of big and strong, but he's kind of a much more low key person than I am. He doesn't have a lot of energy and he's just sort of a mellow guy. And she passes out the spoons and she's like, try to bend them. I'm like bending. I'm like, okay, I can't bend it by normal means. This guy was really strong, couldn't. And then she's like, okay, you stare at them and like yell bend. I'm like, seems like such bullshit okay and I'm like do that nothing I still can't bend it my friend can't bend it but I look around and I see these people like balling them up and I was like I remember looking I was like what the fuck holy shit I remember like screaming that aloud everyone's like looking at me and laughing and then suddenly my hands like get this like searing intense heat in them and the spoon feels really hot but it didn't hurt it wasn't like burning hot it was just like this searing intense heat and then the spoon was so soft. And it was like, I barely using like two fingers, like very lightly pushed the top of the spoon down with almost no effort. And then it just got like cool again, cooled off and I couldn't bend it anymore. I mean, maybe if I used all my strength, I could have, but like, you know, and I was just like that. I don't even know what to say. That's amazing. And then to get a bit of verification. And again, I mentioned this part will be in my second book. A few years later, I go to an event at Forever Family Foundation Conference run by Lloyd, and it's on spoon and fork bending. And I'm in a group with like four other women about my size and one man who's really big. And of the women, they're all sort of mediums. I believe Janet Mayer was in there, and she's a certified medium with Forever Family Foundation. I don't remember if there was another certified one. I can't remember. There are others who were like, to find themselves as mediums and we're at forever family this was an af media afterlife and mediumship convention not a grief retreat so there were opportunities for people who wanted to develop their mediumship abilities to attend this one too and work on them so what was crazy was so I could do it that time in Laura's and not again so I couldn't bend them and the exact same ones that I as not a medium could not bend I started passing them over to these again women my size and strength I was passing them over to them and they were just like bending them up in instantly. So I was like, okay, this verifies. These are not trick spoons or forks. There isn't a trick to this. This was genuine. And I mean, I also, you know, I mean, skeptics will say, what does it matter with trust with science? But I mean, I genuinely 100% trust that Laura is not cheating, giving us like 
fake spoons. I 100% trust that <laughs> Lloyd's not cheating and giving us fake spoons. And, you know, take that how you want. I wouldn't have believed me saying that early on. But so, like, if you're in grief, go meet these people for yourself and see what you start to think, you know? And so I... But that just verifies like that they could bend the exact same ones I couldn't. And in Laura's class, like my friend, the guy who's much stronger, but like not as energetic, couldn't bend his and I could bend it. So that's, I just find that, I mean, that just adds another layer of verification. I, I, I'm not a, a bender, but I know people who that they are. And one of them was on one of our podcasts. Her name is Donna Ribadell. And she didn't know till she went to the Monroe uh, Center that she could bend spoons. She, I think she was in her early 60s and she just took a class like you did, but discovered that she continually bends hundreds and hundreds of spoons and forks. Wow. And so when we had her on the show, she said, shall we do what, do a bending? And I said, well, I don't know if I can bend on the show, but it worked beautifully and she bent the spoon and I bent it with her. And we had some listeners who wrote in and said they'd never been able to bend the spoon, but they got one for the show and they were able to bend it for the first time through her, you know, she was just guided them. So anyone who wants to see it actually happening can watch that show with Donna Ribadell and she owes or she credits, she had died uh, drowning and came back. And when she came back, she had all these new different abilities. And so I think she credits the spoon bending ability to the experience she had of dying and, you know, returning. That she returned with different abilities and that was one of the abilities. So she does, she make, she, she does them. I went out to dinner and met her in Colorado recently and we were just sitting at the restaurant and she said, yeah, my friend told me not to do anything in, in restaurants, she said, but look, I can't help it. And she's standing there, she just touched the fork and the tongs are just twirling up, you know, and I'm watching it happen there and I'm going, I guess they can't take you out, you know? <laughs> oh my God, she doesn't want to go to like right. someone's home who has really expensive, I like grandma's collection of silverware that's passed down generations. <laughs> she might know. So... We're getting up around our hourish, but I have a couple of other things I want to talk about. The I want to talk about uh, the apport, yes. and uh, specifically because just the woman I just happened to speak to you about made this um, necklace for me. I don't know if you can see it in the thing, and you see the little blue glass bead. Yeah, yeah, it. I see that. So. I have never experienced, I think it's called a port or a port, a port. And you write about it in your book in reference to these green feathers that yes. appeared under your bed and that you needed it to be five and the fifth fe feather appeared later in your, in your, in your house. And I had Stanley Krippner over for dinner last week and while we were having dinner, he said, I have to show you these two pictures. I had two apports that came to uh, my house. And uh, he said, and, you know, one of them was a little toy ninja. And he doesn't have children or kids that come there. And the other was a very old, very old piece of stone that it looked like it had once maybe been the form of a person. It looked like there might have been hands on it. And they were all, you know, tiny. And so... He said to me, which was what I wanted to say, I had read in your book and I wasn't sure if you knew, but there is actually a place that does study this. And in your book, you said, oh, I wish there was somewhere. And I think one of your people said, no, there isn't. So I just wanted oh, yeah. you to know, I called him this morning to get the actual name. So you would know there is a place that people send apports to, because when I was at his house, he had a whole box of them from Brazil, from places he had been in Brazil and he was sending it off to it. So they send it to the Calgary, University of Calgary in Edmonton, uh, Canada. And they have a group there where they receive reports from different people all over the world. And they're studying them scientifically to see, do they have a different thing in the stone? Does it seem, does it have different properties? So I just wanted you to know that there is actually a place that is studying that. 
And uh, this friend of mine, also a podcast guest, Sean McNamara, was writing a book about um, uh, microdosing mushrooms and how does that affect your psychic? And he did it with this group of people and they did this once a week and he'll be on next month on my show with his new book. And he said he was in a coffee shop and he had been thinking about this woman, Jean Millay, who was a very dear, dear friend of mine and uh, who did a lot of seances and mediumship and all these different things through her life, remote viewing and things with sound and light. And he said, this blue little glass bead fell out of nowhere. And he looked around the coffee shop. He looked around at the people. He asked everybody. And there was no one that knew where this little blue thing just fell out of nowhere while he was doing his research on her. So he felt that this was an apport that had come as a message from her. And so when I got to meet him for the first time, just a couple months ago, I went out to, to Colorado to meet these different guests I'd had. And he gave me the a port, this little glass bead. And the other woman turned it into a necklace. So when Stanley came, it was two days after I'd received this. And I felt like I was, you know, just like all of a sudden they were talking spoon bending. All of a sudden, what's this a ports things that are coming everywhere? So it's nothing I can believe in because I haven't seen it happen. But I was wondering what was your you know, and I cherish this thing, and I'm just very touched that he would share this with me. What is, and I'm not sending it off to Canada or anything, but I was wondering what your experience was, and if you had your feathers, you could send one of them to this uh, university, or you could contact them and see about, so if you could just tell the story about the feathers. Yeah, oh, I want to send it to them. Also, I'm like, I want to reach out to them and have them like, I want to talk to them, have a right. podcast, meet with them. Wow. Right, and I, tell, I them that, tell them that, tell them that, you know, you you were you were told by Stanley Krippner that this was a place that could, mm -hmm. you know, because he's been sending to them to them over the years. Oh, wow. Yeah, I definitely will send a feather there and see what they say. Um. So the feathers, the green yes, feathers. It they didn't read the book, the audience yet. <laughs> no. So I will tell. This is really a batshit sign. Um, most likely. I always give my dis skeptical disclaimer. So early on in my grave, I started learning and reading about signs. And I was like, that seems like that's just too convenient. Like if you say something what is, I'm gonna mispronounce it like I wrote it in the book like the Boehner Midoff or something it's the concept the frequency illusion that as soon as you hear something for the first time or think of so something you start seeing it everywhere I'm like okay that's that's a psychological fact so of course people believe they have signs and so again I said green's my dad's favorite color and I kept hearing feathers are a sign and they just so one day I'm walking down the street. I'm in living at home, home at this time, shortly after his passing on which is in Manhattan on the Upper East Side. Like there aren't a ton of like weird birds there or like super trendy. It's a little more like a conservative neighborhood. So everyone's not wearing like crazy feathery things. And I see a green feather sitting on the street. I'm like, meh, I will pick it up and I will consider it. So I took it home. I don't actually even know where that one is anymore, but like this is just the start of the story. So then. I leave it there. I end up maybe about a year later getting a reading with a medium, Gina Simone. She's certified by Forever Family. She's amazing, excellent medium. And she gave me a very evidential reading, got like the name of my dad, got the name of my uncle, like a lot of things. So it gets to the end of the reading and she's like, do you have any questions for me? Now, you know, normally that's a time to like, ask like something I don't know like a little more like spiritual maybe but of course I do it like to test and score so I was like my dad sent me a sign what is it and then, you know poor Gina she's like well it was actually kind of cool because she was like well I don't really like to say that because let's say you're set on one sign it turns out to be something else you don't notice the signs let's say you want me to say green feather I was like okay Gina it was a green feather she's like well there you go this is just the start of this like bat shittery so <laughs> next like fast forward like another year and I'm at the forever family foundation grief retreat this point I'm making little mini like 
I think it was before Reels for Instagram. So I was making little mini videos for IGTV, if anyone remembers that, before Reels blew up and TikTok blew up. It was like the little mini videos. And I was getting them of all the mediums. And I missed Gina and she ended up leaving before I could get it. It's just, it's a very busy weekend, especially for the mediums. Mm -hmm. And I felt bad. And I went and told Fran and she was like, oh, no worries. Just email her and see if you, if she wants, you can just record it online. And I'm the kind of person once, like I noted that once something's solved, I don't sit and overly think about it. And for some reason, I just started obsessing about this, but like the way a song stuck in your head. I was like, oh, I feel so bad. I missed getting Gina. She was so good. Remember, she got the green feather. So that evening, I'm taking the train home into the city and from Connecticut into New York. And I just am like, I'm doing other things, but I keep obsessing about how I miss Gina, but not even emotionally. It was just like this line over and over in my head. I feel so bad. I miss getting Gina. It was so great. She got the green feather. I go in home, home. I'm like with, my, I still call it my parents' place. I go stay at my parents' place that night instead of my apartment in Brooklyn because my animals were there and I didn't, was too tired to take them on the subway. So I fall asleep. Next morning, I'm taking them and it's like a loop in my head. I feel so bad. I miss Gina. That was so great when she got the green feather. As I'm on the subway, getting closer and closer to my apartment, it's more stuck in my head, but getting like narrowed down. That's so amazing. Gina got the green feather. That's so amazing. Gina got the green feather. As I'm walking up the steps in my apartment, I just keep hearing green feather, green feather, like not hearing a voice, but like a loop in my head when a song is so annoyingly stuck in your head, you can't get it out. I'm like, I know, like why? Like brain, shut the fuck up. Like I know I'm, I I already emailed Gina because I can't stop thinking about it. So I already sent her the email. Like what is going on? I go into my room, I sit on my bed, I start like doing emails for my real job. And I'm like, look over. I was like, no, no. On the floor, like under my clothing rack, actually wasn't my bed, under my clothing rack. I was like, what is that? There's a pile of green feathers. And I walk over, I was like, I'm hallucinating. And there's, so in the book, I make five, my lucky number. Again, I sort of disguise this stuff. Probably if I wrote it now, I wouldn't disguise those things. But like at the time, every little thing could have been a possible piece of evidence. So just be consistent. I'll say five is my lucky number. But the story, the, the facts are true, even if I just disguised a few things being obsessively evidence-based. So there were four green feathers. I was like, no. And but immediately, like, I feel this like wave of like, well, I mean, I don't think that was necessarily a spiritual thing that I felt the wave. I think it was like a logical, holy, what the fuck that anyone would feel just astounded. So, and I was laughing and I was like, how did this happen? Like I, at that point I did have roommates. Um, I didn't own anything with green feathers. Maybe they went in my room, which I mean, we weren't friends. It would have been a little odd of them to go in my room, but maybe they, you know, that's kind of maybe how it works. We're like the non-local consciousness will press on people's minds and tell them to do things and maybe it was somehow could have been orchestrated so I'm not saying they necessarily imported but maybe and I wasn't really friends with my roommates I didn't want to ask them I felt like that would seem fussy too but I'm just saying that could have fallen off something on my roommates which still would have been so interesting they chose to wear that go in my room and it fell off so this is it's not even done yet so of course I take a photo I email it to Fran I'm like this is really weird. This just happened. I attached a photo. Can you confirm you actually see green feathers in this photo? And do you know a lab I could send them to? And that's, Fran did not know about this lab. And so she said she didn't really know somewhere I could send them. But yes, she saw the photos. And then because I'm like, always want more evidence. I was like, you know, there's four, but five's my lucky number. I want a fifth. Two weeks later, I found a fifth one sitting in my living room and I, I carry them with me everywhere still. And now yeah, it's a good idea. I'm going to take one and send it to the support lab. I think it's a fantastic so, story. Yeah. yeah. And I emailed also, it to Gina who was like, I love it. Love it. I carry them. I show them to like researchers. So I'm with you on the fives. Uh, I'm born five, 15, 55. And oh, so no I've always, I've been a five from the beginning. <laughs> I just, I just feel very good about that number. And I like it when it's in things, my addresses, phone numbers, whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's a wonderful story of explaining how something appears out of nowhere and can be very significant. And you didn't, I think the person you might have been in 2013 might have just 
thought of it as, oh, just there's something left here. Somebody must have left it. But when you started doing your investigating from 2015 on, you realize that there are other methods and things that happen. Time isn't the way we know it. And somehow things can be materialized and it, it could be from some other place or, or time because it just somehow traveled into your space. Right. Yeah. My grandparents could have been sending me signs like every five minutes before I would, I didn't even, I wouldn't have even thought to look, I, you know, I mean, uh, yeah. So it was, it was something you mentioned somewhere and I can't remember the details, but it was when you were younger and it was something about a woman and I was voice. the whole time that was that your grandmother and you're on your mom's side. Yes. And that's who I thought that was when I was reading about that. That's uh, who I think it might have been. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So we're, well, we're both yeah. on the same page of the book. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm just going to go down here on my little list and um, let's see. I did want to, I don't, I, I don't think I want to, well, we won't go into Lilydale because that sounded like a very strange thing, but that was actually one yeah. of the things I liked about your book was that you also showed the mediums that are the charlatans and mm -hmm. you were very, I thought you were very respectful to them. And um, I don't know if you have just a quickie to just tell the people what Lilydale is and where you had the experience of knowing what you know, phony mediumship is, or just like Lloyd says, it could be a little bit of truth mixed in with this. And I thought your discovery and the way you handled that was very professional. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I'd, I'd read a lot about the Society for Cyclical Research studies back in the day and how they handled it when they uncovered fraud. So I decided to, I just would handle it the same way. Plus there's, it wasn't like I was alone with him in a lab. There were other human beings there with a lot of grief who really believed in him or just you know, I, whether they specifically were seeing him for grief or just, you know, uh, life is always filled with grief and disappointments, you know, but they, they got a lot out of him. So I was not going to just rudely expose somebody, but yeah. So Lilydale is a village in upstate New York and it's like this little tiny community. It's actually a really never lovely bit. It. Oh, you have? Been? Oh, no, I never heard of it lovely little vacation experience it's like these tiny little houses and they're beautiful they look like little dolls houses there's like three little cafes it's almost like being in a little like tiny village and you start seeing the same people every time you go and it's all psychic mediums and you have to be a psychic medium to have a house there maybe they would allow a researcher I don't know I don't know how they I... test you like if they you know instead they, of okay the there you go <laughs> There and you, the move here. you probably have to show like your website. I don't know, but there's no science-based testing. There are some mediums I know who've been part of it that are wonderful. You know, sadly she's passed, but Johanna, Janet Nohavik was a wonderful medium who was involved there. Joe Scheel, I don't know if he's still involved, but he was there. He's a wonderful medium. So they have some very highly evidential and they have a large amount that are not evidential it's a very hit or miss and there's a lot of nonsense there and some genuine and it's really just like if you're going in deep 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 grief and you really want evidence I don't recommend Lilydale if you're going for an experience or if you're a researcher and really curious I think it's great um if you already believe this and you want to have like a really nice time with like a beautiful community go um but if you're going and you're questioning if survival's true and you had bad experiences at Lilydale, don't worry. Don't worry. That that's they're not evidence and they're not science. But like the hotel I stayed in was from the 1800s. I mean, it was just it was a really cool experience. However, I attended a three part three night seance. The first night was a discussion with the I call them seance medium. I don't name and shame in my book. Like no, I try. I, yeah. I, I, Oh, good. Thank you. Yeah. Some people are like, you should give their names. I'm like, no, no it I mean, doesn't no, matter. It right. doesn't matter. Like I'm, I'm teaching people like what to look for and you know, it's frauds are a dime a dozen, you know, and genuine is, you know, it's better to learn how to find genuine yourself. And, and then he had two nights of 
holding a seance and it was just I mean I was really excited about it I was really hopeful but it was stage magic it was like a carnival show completely fake does he have any real abilities who's to say but none were demonstrated that night at all my guess is he does not but I will say I could think maybe because I think genuine physical mediumship I've heard exceptions with Stuart Alexander I don't know or the school but school took years and years of the same group sitting Stuart Alexander doesn't have guests constant influx of new guests coming in he's um hosts physical mediumship seances if any listeners don't know and for everything I've heard I think I I haven't heard anything where which would make me think he's not genuine but this one the only reason I can see maybe is so Stuart Alexander just keeps his circle who sits very tight and it's the same people this one has like 30 people coming in everyone's paying it's different people all the time so the reason I can say maybe is genuine abilities is really genuine abilities are not so dramatic. They're very subtle. It takes a lot of time. Like you might sit there for hours for like two weeks and nothing would happen. Then some, like you hear a voice or an object moves. And this was just like things floating. He had like quote unquote ectoplasm, like what she calls what I wanted until- to speak about was the ectoplasm. Yeah, the Santa beard. <laughs> yes, because when I read about these this this form and I was reading about when it was done like in 1950s or 20, whatever, and I'm reading about this and I'm going online and I'm reading about more of them and this ectoplasma thing just did not sit well with me. And I called my friend Russell Targ and I said, have you ever experienced this kind of a thing where they put a person in a closet or a cabinet and everything has to be pitch black dark and and then all of a sudden this ectoplasm thing appears coming out of their nose or their face and he said yeah I was in England at one of those and he said and I can tell you it was all stage magic and it was all you know he said if the person can't just do it sitting in a room with you and they have to be tied up and locked up and all these other kind of things uh, he said, I can tell you that that was not a real experience. And I said, I'm so glad to hear this because the ectoplasma thing seemed totally crazy to me. So I was wondering if you could just tell our audience for then he wants to know about that you are a true skeptic. You're telling about the real mediums you've met that really were giving evidential. And then you're also sharing about these phonies. So if you could just explain the ectoplasma, because I think that's the most hysterical thing <laughs> that you can have stuff coming oh. out of your nose and your eyes. Oh my God. Now, I don't know if ectoplasm is real or not. Like, I I, I don't know if other physical I, I mediums either. have done it. I have no idea. So this is where I witnessed it, and no, it was not real. <laughs> um, it's supposedly some substance. I actually asked him the first night, and I was genuinely giving him a chance. Like, I didn't, you know, I always go into these neutral. Right. Like, maybe they're genuine, maybe they're not. And so I asked him, if there's been any laboratory studies of ectoplasm, it what it's what it's um composed of, and where could I? And he's like, oh yes, and he starts spewing what it's made of. I don't remember, and I was like, where can I read this study and results? And he's like, oh, uh, I don't know. Uh, find me afterwards. Uh, you know, I mean, he they're clearly he was not referencing any studies, and it the thought is it's. I mean, I hear different things, but essentially what it does, it's somehow saying it's taking like in a seance or physical mediumship circle, it's taking like the substance or energy out of the air and forming things like supposedly it's ectoplasm that can form like the face of somebody who's passed away. And there's evidence that's been used that way. I don't know if that's ectoplasm or not, but it's also according to this medium and some of the seance circles it forms like this sort of semi-solid like semi gaseous like mist that's a little bit you know that would form shapes like web-like was sort of web-like like, i guess yeah, yeah. that would form shapes so everybody at this seance in lilydale from the day before i went was like oh i wonder if he's gonna have ectoplasm i wonder if he's gonna have ectoplasm and he's like i'm gonna try i'm gonna try and the first night he is unable to manifest ectoplasm. Interestingly, the airline had lost his suitcase the same night he's unable to manifest ectoplasm. Then his suitcase, I didn't put that part in my book, but 
Ben apparently sees like, oh, my suitcase came the next night, the night he's able to manifest ectoplasm. So he's sitting there and he's in a cabinet, which means like it's pitch black, except for little bits of lights that will be dim. And the cabinet, if anyone doesn't know, is like a dark, it's like a little cloth tent. And yeah, I, I would agree with Russell Targ. Like, why can't you don't, no, don't sit in a cabinet. Apparently, Stuart Alexander does not sit in a cabinet. And, you know, everything's not so hidden with him. So he's in this little black tent and then he's like roaring and stomping and music's blasting. And he's like, the ectoplasm. <laughs> and he's like coughing it out. And then the lights come on very dimly and the cabinet opens and he's like, there's ectoplasm. And he has picked me as his favorite. I do not know why. Like, that's one of the things in my book I try to analyze. Um, I don't know if he thought I was sort of in on it with him. And he was, like, trying to get me. You know, I mean, frauds probably think other people are kind of frauds, too. So did he think I was just researching and writing a book to make money? Maybe he thought I was, like, we were in on it together. Uh, so maybe he was like trying to manage me and watch me because he was nervous I would expose him and was, he did make like funny comments the second night after I was acting like I clearly didn't believe him anymore even though I was being very polite he made comments about journalists and he's like journalists try to expose me and he's like looking at me so maybe I don't know but he calls me up to the front to like get a close look at this. Like the person who's going to know this is bullshit. And I walk up. It's like a drugstore Santa beard. He's wearing a drugstore Santa beard. And the whole room is like ooing and eyeing. And I mean, I wanted to be respectful. I wasn't going to make a huge scene. I was just like, okay. Yeah. I was like, wow. Like, you know, I didn't want to lie, but I didn't want to cause drama either so I was just like wow amazing you know kind of not super engaged but I was also very baffled and amused like and sad you know fraud is not a kind thing and no one benefits from it I mean I guess he's financially benefiting from it but in a bigger picture no one benefits from fraud and so it's just it was like every kind of emotion from like fascinated I mean some people are like especially mediums are like were you so angry and so upset but no I wasn't because I thought all of this was going to be fraud stepping into this so I I was expecting I was surprised I hadn't encountered more fraud and I'd also read all the history of the cases of the Society for Cyclical Research SPR and they saw fraud on a regular basis so this was just par for the course so I I mean, no, I wasn't like, oh, this is amazing. This is fraud. But it was what I expected on this, like when I embarked on this research. And so, and he was just, yeah, it was like the Santa beard. And people were just like amazed. I mean, it's really, everyone was just like, oh my God, this is ectoplasm. And, you know, I just sort of played along, but not, I, I was kind of towing the line of being like, I don't believe you touch sarcastic without like making a drama you know and you, you touch the ectoplasma right he didn't let me touch it no and the theory is they say if you touch it it shoots back into the medium and the medium could die i mean he didn't want me to touch a santa beard you know <laughs> I mean, they, that's the truth and he didn't want to be exposed and after the seance i like discreetly snuck into the room I wanted to see what I could figure out and he had a suitcase with like all the props including the Santa beard I was like not in a, even a little bit surprised but he had like a magic uh, it was just all stage magic it was yes. nothing real not one real thing well that's a wonderful story uh <laughs> I'm gonna uh, wind us down now and say that um uh that I'm very glad that both you and I have received messages from our dads and that um, uh, I, I'm very grateful that we both did similar things by just asking them, dad, if you're really there and if you're really trying to uh, communicate or be in touch with me, please give me a sign. And I'm grateful for those signs. I'm not gonna share more stories because 
we're getting to the end here, but uh, I'm just saying to you how wonderful that your dad has connected with you and that you know to honor the signs when he arrives. And uh, I'm grateful also because like you, I was searching and searching in the beginning from his death, like, where is he? And it took a while for that to happen, but I'm very grateful for the appearances in dreams or in birds or whenever we find that someone we've loved is trying to communicate to us. I want to also thank you for writing a book that shows all of the hard work that you did to show that these things are not all charlatans and they are not fake and that these mediums are bringing relief or uh, some sort of uh, closure for some of the people who are diswrought. And what a beautiful job that is that they do this. And I also know how, like people say, oh, you know, you can't do that many readings without it exhausting you. And it's really a wonderful thing that these people are taking the time to do this work in the Forever family and in these places where they're credible and that the listeners should know, yes, this woman, Liz, has checked out the credible and the non-credible, and she shares all of that in this book. And what I'd like to end on is if you could just give us a little glimpse of what your next book is going to be about, and if there's anything else you want to share with the listeners, and and I'm, I'm, I'm just waiting to hear what you have to say. Great. So the next book is a continuation. This book ends, I guess, around like 2018. And so much has happened since then. So the second book start picks up where this one left off and mentions, you know, that second part of the spoon bending that I discussed that kind of gave more evidence. So just tons more stories like that. And it goes through, I guess, 2021. And I'm also working to note, taking those for part three, because I mean, the further you go, the more and more intense things start happening so you know that was I think one thing I touch upon in my book that you know I when my dad passed it feels like oh this is the end of everything but really it's just the beginning that's kind of what a friend said and I feel like I'm right now like I feel like the conclusion of this book was really just the beginning and so that's it it it, it probably still just at the beginning because this evidence just the further you go the crazier it gets and without getting too crazy that's one thing I want to add there's a when it's genuine there's a subtlety to it that's really beautiful it's not the level of dramatic entertaining of seance medium and that's but it it has a sort of a much subtler and sort of truth to it you know and and that seems to be a consistent thread and whether it's case of kids with past life memories you know kids remember having warm milk at their grandma's not being like a princess in like a palace and and to me and like you just hear a, a voice and maybe one object moving in a genuine seance as opposed to like hours of like this dramatic and and to me I think that's really that's one of the things I love about the genuineness of it is the subtle beauty so and it just keeps happening <laughs> so I think the more you research the more these things are going to happen to you also and I'm wondering if you may end up going down a medium path yourself and doing some sort of things in the future. I don't know. You seem to have some special abilities like we all do. I have very, very few abilities. I would love to hopefully have my businesses take off, make a lot of money and start research labs. I'm probably more the research type than actually. I've had abilities a few times, but not to the level where I think I could actually help grieving people giving readings. but. I mean, if it happened, I would be so fascinated. I would probably just check myself into Division of Perceptual Studies and be like, let's test me. And I would sit home and test myself all day with research. I'd love it. It'd be so fun. But I don't think I have those abilities. But I don't know. I, I mean, We're going to wait and see. We don't know what book three will be yet. <laughs> all right. All right. <laughs> so I want to thank you so much for being here with us today. And I look forward to your next book coming out because I thoroughly enjoyed the reading and as you can tell I, I I you can tell I've meant enough things in there to know that you I've read it from cover to cover and uh and I feel like I know you better than I did before so I want to thank you for being a guest on a small medium at large podcast 
And I want to thank our listeners for subscribing, sharing. You can find us on YouTube, Spotify, Apple, Google Podcasts. And I want to thank my children, Nancy and Rich, for posting my show, putting the music and the titles, and doing all the technical work that I'm not capable of doing. So thanks for my support team, and have a wonderful week. And remember, share your stories, because stories can heal. And thanks. Have a great week. Bye.